Okay, this lecture is going to cover the topics of motivation and emotion. So theories of motivation attempt to explain the whys of behavior. Why do we get out of bed in the morning? Uh, why do people exercise? Why do we sign up for school? And theories of emotion attempt to explain why we feel the way that we do. So uh, why do we feel sad when we watch a commercial um, that has a sad content? Why do we feel happy when we achieve something? Um, and so we're going to start by defining motivation. Motivation is the process by which activities are started, directed, and continued so that physical or psychological needs or wants are met. So if you had a physical goal of losing weight, maybe the first thing you do is sign up for the gym. Uh, and that would be starting the activity. Directing the activity would be to go to the gym um, or buy workout clothes or healthy food or whatever. And then continuing that um, activity would just be kind of the maintenance of that behavior. So continuing to go to the gym, continuing to eat right. Uh, and doing those things are collectively you being motiv motivated to reach your goal of losing weight. So motivation theories consider the factors that direct and energize behavior. It's a complex concept. It includes biological and cognitive, um, kind of what your thoughts are, as well as social aspects. And there are several different approaches to uh, explain motivation and, and what motivates us and why we're motivated and why we aren't in certain situations. Um, and you don't have to agree with all of the different theories. You can kind of pick and choose which ones make sense to you or what parts of the theories make sense to you. Psychologists certainly aren't in agreement between all of the different theories, so you do not have to be either. And so as a kind of warm-up, uh, check out this video that's going to cover broadly some of the topics that we're going to be looking at in this lecture on motivation. You probably heard this story. Aaron Ralston was out climbing in Utah's Blue John Canyon when a giant rock shifted under his feet and he fell, pinning his right arm to the canyon wall. He was stuck. And worse, he hadn't told anyone where he was going. For the next five days, Ralston tried to move and chip away at the rock. He ate his remaining food, drank the last of his water. Eventually, he drank his own urine and started videotaping his goodbyes. But then something happened. Ralston had a dream. He saw himself as a father picking up his son, and with that vision, an overpowering will to survive kicked in. He broke his arm bones, sawed through his flesh with a dull pocket knife, and freed himself. Ralston harnessed some of our most powerful psychological forces. Hunger, thirst, desire to be part of a family, need to return to the human community, they ignited his tenacity, which allowed him to do an incredible thing. He harnessed the power of motivation. Obviously, in a big, big way. <laughs> In its most basic sense, motivation is the need or desire to do something, whether that need is biological, social, or emotional, and whether that something is making dinner, going to college, or cutting off your arm. Motivation is what gets you moving. But the big question is, why? Why do we do anything? I mean, why ever bother changing out of my sweatpants? Psychologists often view motivation in one or more of four ways. On their own, none of these theories is perfect, but taken together, they help us understand what drives us. Let's start with the first theory, an evolutionary perspective. For a while, in the early 20th century, it was popular to think of all behaviors as instincts, or innate drives to act a certain way. But this so-called instinct theory was misguided, in part because the presence of a tendency doesn't always mean it's supposed to be there. Like, we can imagine why a bunch of people might start rioting at a heated soccer match, but to say that they're supposed to a little short-sighted. Evolution is a far more complex, chaotic, and interesting process than that. Plenty of behaviors could just be accidents of evolution. Late paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould called these accidents spandrels, or traits that rather than being adaptive, just stuck around as byproducts of other processes. Today, we define instincts as complex, unlearned behaviors that have a fixed pattern throughout a species. For example, dogs instinctively shake their fur when wet, salmon return to the stream in which they hatched, and human babies know how to suck 
buckle just minutes after being born. These are true genetically predisposed instincts that do not require learning. But today we understand that while certain tendencies may be genetic, individual experience plays a major role in behavior and motivation as well. So another theory of motivation suggests that a psychological need or drive simply compels us to reduce that need. This is called the drive reduction theory. This could be as simple as hearing my stomach growl and looking for a burrito. My need is food, my drive is hunger, my drive reduction behavior is burrito. Drive reduction is all about maintaining your body's homeostasis, the balance of its physiological systems. As much as we're pushed to reduce our drives, we're also pulled along by incentives. The positive or negative stimuli that either entice or repel us. The mouth-watering smell of that burrito pulls me toward it just as much as my hunger pushes me there. However, we're also clearly more complicated than our homeostatic systems, and drive reduction theory may oversimplify a lot of our behavior. For example, a person may fast for days, ignoring their their body's hunger to honor some spiritual or political cause, and I know I'm not the only one who sometimes eats when I'm not actually hungry. So a third theory, the theory of optimal arousal, attempts to fill in some of those gaps. It suggests, rather than just reducing a drive or tension like hunger, we're motivated to maintain a balance between stimulation and relaxation. Say you're holed up in your house all weekend studying, you're bored and lonely and getting weird, so you call up some friends to go mountain biking or go to a karaoke bar or whatever you like. Like to do for stimulation. The idea here is that you want to hit the right level of arousal, which take note psychologists often use in a non-sexual sense, without getting overstimulated and stressed. So if you nearly break your face on that bike ride or the journey covers at karaoke night start getting too intense, you may need to back off and take a nap. Of course, everyone has a different level of optimal arousal, and I'm guessing Aaron Ralston's was fairly high. Adrenaline junkies may jump out of planes to hit their ideal level, whereas others might be satiated by an engaging book or a new knitting pattern. No matter which, the optimal arousal theory suggests that we're motivated to avoid both boredom and stress. And obviously, not all needs are created equally. If I'm suffocating and can't catch a breath, I'm not going to be thinking about eating that burrito, and if I'm about to be ravaged by lions, I'm not going to be worrying about my next paycheck. American psychologist Abraham Maslow illustrated this shuffling of priorities in the mid-1900s with his famous hierarchy of needs. Down at the bottom of the pyramid, you'll find our most basic physiological needs for food, water, air, and moderate temperatures. The next rung up speaks to our need for safety, then comes love and belonging, followed by esteem or respect, and finally, once all those needs have been met, we have the relative luxury of being motivated by self-actualization and spiritual growth and yoga retreats and stuff. Of course, there are problems with Maslow's vision. Empirical research hasn't really supported his hierarchy. We tend to skip around on that pyramid all the time, and the importance of those higher-level needs may vary depending on our culture and finances and personalities. But still, everyone is restricted by the lowest levels of the pyramid, so regardless of theories about why we have them, most schools of psychological thought agree that we are driven by at least three big motivators. Sex, hunger, and the need to belong. We'll do a whole lesson later on all sorts of sex-related stuff, including how it motivates us. There's a lot there. For now, let's just say that sexual motivation is how we promote the survival of our species through recreation and or procreation, both of which help human communities bond and expand. Without it, none of us would be here today thinking about burritos and severed arms and sex and stuff. Internally, we are biologically driven to knock boots by our sex hormones. We're also motivated by psychological and socio-cultural influences ranging from suggestive external stimuli plastered all over billboards, magazines, and TVs in the form of, you know, like, scantily clad bodies sprawled out on beaches, to more genteel desires like love and family or adherence to personal, religious, and cultural values. Sex is a big motivator, but it isn't precisely a need. No matter what anyone has told you, people do not die without it. Hunger, though. After air and water, food is our body's greatest need, and thus obtaining food is one of our greatest motivations. Hunger may seem pretty simple, eat food, stay alive, but physiologically and psychologically there is a lot going on, and like so many things, it starts in the brain. The sensation of hunger usually begins with a drop in your blood sugar level. Glucose is our body's primary source of energy, and while you might not initially feel a drop, your brain will. Your hypothalamus monitors your blood chemistry and responds to both high levels of the hunger hormone ghrelin and low levels of glucose by triggering that feeling of hunger, reminding you to eat something. I am in fact experiencing it right now. Once you've eaten that burrito, your metabolism takes over, converting that food into energy. But while our physiological need for calories varies depending on our body size and composition, your gender and your age, our hunger is also shaped by our psychology, culture, and mood. And these factors don't just rule when we're 
we're hungry, they also guide what we're hungry for. Biologically speaking, most humans and many other animals have a genetic taste for sweets and fatty foods because they're typically high in energy, but other taste preferences are conditioned through experience and culture. I may have an aversion to oysters because they once made me sick and love gingerbread cookies because my grandma used to make them. Although popular in Cambodia, I'm not too keen on eating fried tarantulas just as lots of folks around the world think that the very idea of peanut butter is gross. Still, the feeling of hunger affects us the same. During World War II in the U.S., some conscientious objectors volunteered for medical research as an alternative way to serve their country. Perhaps the most famous of these studies was physiologist Ansel Keys' Minnesota Hunger Experiment, which measured the effects of semi-starvation by partially starving its volunteers. While ethically dubious, the experiment was geared toward understanding the many small and large effects of hunger which was plaguing Europe at the time. The study started in 1944 by feeding 36 young, healthy men a normal diet for three months, then halving their caloric intake for six months, then slowly rehabilitating them to normal weight during the last three months. They ate mostly wartime foods like root vegetables, bread, and pastas, and were required to walk 22 miles and participate in various work and educational activities for 40 hours each week. The goal was to see a 25% drop in body weight during the starvation period. And as you can imagine, the changes were dramatic. The men became gaunt and listless and showed a decrease in strength, heart rate, and body temperature. But the psychological effects were perhaps even more dramatic. The men became totally obsessed with food. They dreamed about it, talked about it all the time, read cookbooks. They lost interest in sex and jokes and social activities. They were irritable, anxious, and depressed. In the end, they were all rehabilitated, but the study gave us some understanding of the devastating psychological effects of starvation. It also showed us something of the social effects as men withdrew from one another and isolated themselves. As one fundamental need was frustrated, these men experienced the decline of another, the need to belong. Humans are social animals. Evolutionarily speaking, it's fair to say that social bonding has helped us survive. It's a tough world out there, and we've got a lot better shot at thriving if we're sharing resources and responsibilities, protecting and supporting each other in groups. That isn't to say you need to be joined at the hip with every everyone. Our social needs have to be balanced with our autonomy, our sense of personal control, so we feel both connected and independent. But sometimes we're denied that sense of belonging. We've all experienced the pain of being ignored or rejected at some point in our lives. It's worse than just about anything. The evidence for this is abundant. One recent study suggested that teenagers who had a sense of belonging to their community had better health and emotional outcomes than those who didn't feel like they belonged. Cultures all over the world use ostracism or social exclusion as a type of punishment, whether it's kids in time out, adults in exile, or prisoners in solitary confinement, separation feels like a punch in the gut. Never underestimate the power behind what motivates us. The need to survive, the need to belong, if you can harness that motivation, you can do just about anything. Just ask Aaron Ralston. If you were motivated to learn today, hopefully you took in four theories of motivation, including the evolutionary perspective, drive reduction, optimal arousal, and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and how sex, hunger, and the need to belong motivate us. Thanks for watching, especially to our sub subscribers who make this whole channel possible. If you'd like to sponsor an episode of Crash Course or even be animated into an upcoming episode, just go to subbable.com slash Crash Course. This episode was written by Kathleen Yale, edited by Blake T. Pastino, and our consultant is Dr. Ranjit Bhagwat. Our director and editor is Nicholas Jenkins. The script supervisor is Michael Aranda, who is also our sound designer, and the graphics team is Thought Cafe. The first theory of motivation that we are going to look at is the instinct approach or the instinct theory. And so uh, instincts are biologically determined and innate patterns of behavior that exist in both people and animals. So the idea is that um, these instincts exist within our reptilian brain or our animal brain and they create behaviors that are not learned but rather are a part of our um, functioning, maybe in a Darwinistic sense, so that we can adapt, survive, reproduce within our environment. Um, and so there are a bunch of different instincts. However, it is a little bit difficult to study and therefore define an instinct, which is one of the main uh, problems that people have with these instinct theories. Um, but these are a list of proposed instincts. Um, it's not necessarily an exhaustive list or even necessarily a correct list, but 
Um, I think this is one of the most comprehensive lists of instincts that I've seen out there. Freud thought that we had uh, two major instincts, which he called Eros and Thanatos. And uh, Eros is the uh, life instinct, which is the instinct to live and survive and reproduce and adapt. And he also thought we had Thanatos, which he actually didn't come up with that term. It was uh, assigned to his instinct later on. But the instinct um, that he described as the death instinct and he says that we all have a unconscious death instinct um, that motivates us to be aggressive and self-destructive, engage in behaviors that are bad for us, like smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol or eating junk food or uh, not exercising or um, even being aggressive towards other people. Um, and so Freud kind of takes this broad look at these instincts uh, and people like Carl Jung argue that we all have an instinct to play, to be curious. So the idea is that these instincts that are pre-programmed within human beings are ultimately what drives their behavior, what motivates them to act in a certain way or to do anything. Um, however, there are some people who disagree with this theory. The opponent's main argument is how do we know that a behavior wasn't learned? How do we know that it was in fact instinctual? Um, and so the concept, the concept of instinct itself can be ambiguous and hard to define. We don't know how many instincts there are. We don't know what constitutes an instinct, how to measure it, for example. Um, and theorists have in the past given names and described the different insti instincts. For example, like flight is, is that instinct to run away. But one of the main problems with this theory is that while they kind of named and identified a bunch of instincts, they didn't exactly explain why the instincts exist. So some people argue that the instinct approaches to motivation have been kind of replaced with the evolutionary perspective that we talked about uh, in chapter one. So the good things about this theory is that it does force us to consider things like the evolutionary perspective and the biological um, components to human behavior. So uh, cognitive approaches to understanding motivation consists of theories that suggest that motivation is a product of people's thoughts and expectations, not their instincts, um, but more so their cognitions. For example, how much a person studies would depend on their expectations of how much studying is going to affect their grade. If they don't think that studying will help them get a higher grade, they're probably not going to study. And there are two main concepts in uh, all of the theories focused on the cognitive approaches to motivation, and those two main concepts are intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation causes us to do something for a concrete, tangible reward. Um, it's a type of motivation in which a person performs an action because it leads to an outcome that is separate from the person or external to the person. For example, a physician working extra hours because they want the money that they get for overtime. The other concept is intrinsic motivation. And this causes us to participate in an activity for our own enjoyment. And it's a type of motivation in which a person performs an action because the action itself is rewarding or satisfying in some manner. So the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is that one really comes from within. It's a passion that drives the person a interest that drives the person to accomplish what they're uh, working towards or to master some concept. Whereas with extrinsic motivation, it doesn't really require the person to enjoy what they're doing whatsoever or be passionate about it or interested in it. If a person is extrinsically motivated, the reason they're engaging in that activity or behavior is in an effort to get something outside of themselves um, and has nothing to do with the actual task that they're working on. So imagine you own a business and you have a bunch of employees. They're not really working as hard as you would like them to work. 
So what do you think that you could do to increase how much they're working, how hard they're working, and also the quality of their work? A lot of businesses and people would generally say, find some way to extrinsically motivate them, throw money at them, offer them more money for completing more tasks. And on the surface, this seems like a reasonable thing to do and like this would work. But actually research shows that this tends to not work in the long term, but instead what works is intrinsic motivation, giving your employees a sense of purpose, recognizing their abilities and talents, and then using those to uh, that person and your advantage. Um, and so when we use intrinsic motivation and try to instill intrinsic motivation in people, uh, and when we ourselves are intrinsically motivated, we tend to be more likely to persevere when we are against obstacles, work harder, and produce higher quality of work. So intrinsic motivation uh, is also correlated with happiness more than extrinsic motivation is. Um, so the idea is that you should find a job or something to do with your time here on Earth that you really love doing, that you're very passionate about, and you will probably do it better, and you will enjoy it more, and this will then relate to your overall well-being and happiness in life. The drive reduction theory of motivation is the next theory that we're going to take a look at. And basically this theory suggests that if you have a lack of a basic biological requirement, then this produces a drive to obtain that requirement. Um, and it's an approach to motivation that assumes that behavior arises from psychological needs that cause these internal drives to push us to satisfy the need, which ultimately will reduce the tension and the arousal that comes from wanting something or desiring something or needing something. So if we are to break down this definition of the drive reduction theory, uh, which was uh, kind of developed by this man here, Clark Hall, and he developed it in the 1920s. So if we were to break it down, the first uh, component that we would look at is the word needs. And so Clark Hall kind of talked about this idea of a need being an important part of the theory, and he says it's a requirement for some material. And he said that it was a requirement for some material that was essential to the survival of an organism or, of course, a human. Um, and so he kind of gave examples of a need being something like food or water. Another important component of the theory is the concept of a drive. So a drive is best described as like a motiv uh, motivational tension or arousal that energizes behavior to fulfill a need. So if you have a need for water, this leads to a thirst drive. So a drive is really a psychological tension and a physical arousal that comes from having a need uh, that ultimately motivates us to act in order to fulfill the need and then reduce that tension, that psychological and physical arousal. So there are two broad types of drives. Uh, there's primary drives and secondary drives. And so primary drives are biological, like hunger, thirst, sleep, sex, and then secondary drives are learned, like achievement, social approval, money. The theory uh, says that we try to satisfy a, dr a drive by reducing the need underlying it. Um, so we have that need for water, that thirst drive, so then we do the action of getting a glass of water. Um, and so this should bring us back to what we call homeostasis, which we've talked about in Chapter 2, uh, which is the body's tendency to try to maintain a steady internal state. So if you look at the slide, the red line here indicates um, homeostasis, or you could look at, it, look at that as an individual's desired level of stimulation. And the drive reduction uh, theory is basically arguing that we're just trying to stay at that red line in terms of our stimulation. We don't really want our level of stimulation to be under the line or above the line, but we want to just stay right there at our desired level of stimulation or at homeostasis, and so we're acting in a way to kind of always 
try to achieve that level of stimulation. So some of the main arguments against the drive reduction approach are kind of corrected in this arousal approach theory. And uh, some of the main problems is if we're just trying to stay at a desired level of stimulation or homeostasis, we're just trying to kind of always maintain a comfortable uh, feeling, then why is it that some people are daredevils, are risk takers, adrenaline junkies? Why do some people seem to be wanting um, these peak moments of stimulation, these heightened, increased levels of um, excitement and energy. So if you've ever um, done something daring, jumped out of a plane, bungee jumped, even went on a roller coaster, um, this kind of goes against the drive reduction approach. Instead, the arousal approach talks about how we do have the need to kind of try to maintain homeostasis, but there are times when we are bored and we want to see a little bit more excitement than just uh, homeostasis. So the arousal approach argues that the need for stimulation motivates behavior and to highlight its point, uh, the theory talks about the fact that we're all born with um, stimulus motives, which are motives that appear to be unlearned but do cause an increase in stimulation like the instincts of curiosity, playing, exploration, these could all be considered stimulus motives and work to increase our desired level of stimulation beyond just a kind of homeostasis um, level of stimulation. So the arousal approach believes that we try to maintain certain levels of stimulation and activity, increasing or reducing them as necessary. So the Yerkes-Dodson law is an important component of the arousal approach theory of motivation, and it's a law stating that performance is related to arousal. And it states that, in fact, the best performance uh, comes when we have a moderate level of arousal. So if you think about the three bears, um, Goldilocks and the three bears, it's it's the just right level of arousal that's going to get us to our best performance in anything, whether it be a test or sports or a social interaction. Uh, if your arousal is too low, you're bored and uninterested. And if your arousal is too high, you're kind of panicked and overly anxious. So in order to do your best on a test or uh, perform the best in a basketball game, you would want your level of arousal to be in the middle, um, not over the top, but not underwhelming either. So there are some people that just seem to be born with a higher uh, level of arousal or need for stimulation than the average person, and these people are called sensation seekers, and they have this need for more complex and varied sensory experiences. So if you take a look at the slide, and grab a scratch piece of paper, you can respond to the following five statements with true or false, and then I'll give you a way to kind of score your responses and see where you fall on this sensation-seeking continuum. Are you a person that needs higher levels of arousal um, or higher levels of stimulation? So generally, people that are sensation-seekers are like your bungee jumpers and your um, you know, skydivers and things like that, gamblers. So, okay, so just write true or false. Number one, I sometimes do crazy things for fun. Two, I prefer friends who are excitingly unpredictable. Three, I am an impulsive person. Four, before I begin a complicated job, I make careful plans. And five, I usually think about what I'm going to do before doing it. So then you can uh, kind of go ahead and look at the scoring section on the slide and give yourself uh, one point if you wrote true for number one. Uh, give yourself one point if you wrote true for number two. Give yourself one point if you put true for number three. And then give yourself one point if you put false for number four. And give yourself another point if you put false for number five. So actually, the, the lowest part on this continuum should say zero. I have a typo there. Um, but 
low sensation seekers, uh, like myself, would be um, lower on the scale, so you'd have like uh, zero points or, or one point or two points, uh, whereas sensation seekers are going to be on the higher end of the continuum, so fours and fives. So you can kind of get some idea of if you are um, having a high need for stimulation or a low need for stimulation generally. So a researcher by the name of McClelland developed uh, what he called needs, needs theory. And in this theory, there are three psychological needs that are not typically accounted for by other theories, but they are actually really popular. Um, a lot of people reference them and kind of stand behind them. So I think they're worthy of discussion. So the first need is the need for achievement. And this is a need that involves a strong desire to succeed in attaining goals, um, not only in realistic goals, but also in challenging goals. So goals could be getting good grades, having a lot of money, winning a sports game, getting high marks on a job evaluation. Um, I think a great example of someone that probably, I, I mean, I'm not friends with him, so I, I couldn't uh, know for sure, but somebody who probably represents a high need for achievement or has a high need for achievement would be Kobe Bryant. I mean, the guy won MVP, he has like a million championships, um, he has a gold medal um, from the Olympics, but he keeps, he keeps playing and challenging himself to always do better and better and better and achieve more and break more records. Um, so people with a high need for achievement look for ways to compete and prove themselves successful. They look for careers and hobbies that allow others to evaluate them so that they can get feedback. They're more likely to attend college and do well, have better economic and occupational success. They generally avoid situations where success will come too easy because that's boring or where success is not likely. Uh, because they need to be able to have an achievement to kind of meet that need. Um, so they prefer an intermediate to uh, difficult level of uh, difficulty. And a low need for achievement person seeks out easy tasks or tasks that most people would fail at anyway. That way um, they can kind of use that as an excuse if they do fail, like no one could have done that is kind of the idea. The next need is the need for affiliation, uh, which could be defined as the need for friendly social interactions and relationships with other people. People that might have a high need for affiliation uh, would be like the homecoming king or queen, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, people who really seek out popularity and who uh, it is something that's very important to. So people with a high need for affiliation tend to be particularly sensitive to their relationships with others. They seek to be liked by others and held in high regard. Um, they prefer to be with their friends the majority of the time. They make great team members, whether it's in a work setting or in a sports team or just someone you're working on something with. Um, and on average, we find that females tend to have a higher need for affiliation than men do. And the final need is the need for power, according to David McClelland, uh, which is the need to have control or influence over others. So some people that might have a high need for power would be like CEOs, politicians, even college professors. <laughs> so people with um, a high need for power are more likely to seek office and belong to organizations. They're more likely to collect status symbols, expensive cars, expensive watches. Uh, when we see the need for power in men, um, when the need is very high, men tend to have higher levels of aggression, drink heavily. Uh, we've even found correlations that men with a very high need for power can be sexually exploitative um, and want to participate in a lot of competitive sports. Whereas women tend to channel their um, need for power into more socially acceptable behaviors, like showing high nurturing behaviors. Um, I have a friend who is very much a person with a high need for power, but she does it in a way that I don't think most people catch on to. In that, um, for example, if we ever go to like Las Vegas or on a trip to the river, 
Uh, she will plan everything down to what we are going to eat, uh, what she'll recommend, clothes that we should wear. Um, in the past, she's asked that we just give her the money that we intend to spend on food, and she'll collect it all and take care of it for us. Um, and so a lot of people are like, oh, this is so thoughtful of her, how nice of her. Um, and I'm always thinking, like, wow, she has a really high need for power, which she's just kind of sublimating into this uh, thing that looks like she's taking care of people. I don't mind it because I don't want to plan all that stuff anyways. It's just an interesting observation. Okay, check out this video on McClellan's needs theory. This motivation model differs from others slightly. It's not about how to motivate or when to motivate. The McClellan motivation theory is about spotting the different types of motivational needs. McClellan identified three motivational needs to be precise. He believed that we all have a need for achievement, a need for affiliation, or a need for power. Most people, of course, will possess a combination of all three with a strong bias towards one, and people will have different characteristics depending on their dominant motivator. Your job is to find out who has which. So let's get to understanding the three needs in a bit more detail. Achievement-motivated people are motivated by a sense of accomplishment. They like to set goals and take calculated risks to complete them, often by working alone. McClellan conducted this really interesting experiment, which I think will help you see exactly the type of person I mean. He asked volunteers to throw rings over pegs, like the kind of games at school fates, you know the ones, but he didn't specify a distance. What he found was that achievement-motivated people carefully tested different distances to find the ideal challenge, not too easy and not impossible. Something else to note, achievement-motivated managers are usually so focused on the task, they disadvantage the individual and the team. Sound familiar? This is John Adair's action-centred leadership model. Have you seen the animation yet? Now, affiliation-motivated people are motivated by interaction with other people. They like to be liked and like to be part of a group and will usually just go along with group decisions. Competition doesn't rate highly for them. They prefer to collaborate, not compete. Folks who are affiliation-motivated will benefit greatly from camaraderie as a motivational factor. This is from the animation three-factor motivation, if you're wondering. Last up, power-motivated individuals are motivated by authority and status. Their own, of course. They like to control others and they like competition. Make that they like to win competitions. Power motivators can be divided into two groups. Personal, which means wanting to control others, and institutional, who like to control a team. As you can probably imagine, those with an institutional power need are usually more desirable as team leaders. Using McClellan's motivation theory, you can identify the dominant motivators of people in your team, then use this information to structure how you motivate and reward them. You could use one of the four R's of motivation. Why don't you go and watch that animation now? Alright, so at this point in the lecture, uh, go ahead and pause the video, head on over to Moodle, complete lecture activity number one, and when you've completed that, come right back here. So if you've ever been full but ate dessert anyways, um, you might have asked yourself, you know, why did I do that? I wasn't even hungry. Um, and the reason why is because dessert is delicious and that is a rewarding feeling. And so this theory, the incentive approach to motivation, looks at how incentives, rewards, uh, tend to drive us to do a whole host of different behaviors. So incentives are defined as things that attract or lure people into action. Uh, so if I were to tell you to pause the video right now and then go study for an hour, um, you might not be very motivated to do that. But if I offered you $100 to do that, you might actually go and do it. So the $100 then would act as an incentive. So the incentive approach is a theory of motivation in which behavior is explained as a response to the external stimulus and its rewarding properties. So, for example, when you're really hungry and you open your fridge and it looks like the image on the slide here, just a bunch of condiments, 
Uh, you could technically just open that bottle of mustard there and down it, and you would get the caloric intake necessary to satiate your hunger. However, we don't do that. We will order a pizza and uh, continue our hunger for another 45 minutes till the pizza arrives, just because the pizza is going to taste better than a bottle of mustard. Um, and so we will hold out for the incentive. We will hold out for the reward. What's interesting to me about the incentive approach is that uh, some theorists in this approach argue that the incentive approach might be insinuating that there's no such thing as a selfless act, that everything we do is with the intention of acquiring some type of reward, whether that be a smile from another person or um, a positive opinion of us from another person or even a self-esteem boost or an ego boost or feeling good about ourselves. Um, no matter what we're doing, the incentive approach argues that we're only doing it for a reward. So if you kind of try to think of an activity that someone might do, a charitable action that someone might do, that you could consider selfless, um, people that subscribe to the incentive approach would have a comeback for why it's not a selfless act, um, but instead, you know, it's trying to, like I've had students say, um, a person that throws their body in front of someone else um, and takes a bullet for them. You could argue that they're trying to die in a, in a way that leaves them with a positive reputation, um, and that's the reward. So it's an interesting idea that there's no such thing as a selfless act. Um, I encourage you to kind of grapple with that idea and try to think of something that a person can do for someone else that warrants absolutely no reward for themselves. And um, it's difficult using kind of this structure of thought of the incentive approach. The next theory of motivation comes from the humanistic approach. And it is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So uh, Abraham Maslow says that there are several level of needs that a person must strive to meet before they can achieve the highest level of personal uh, personality fulfillment, which he calls self-actualization, which is a fully functioning person. Um, some people liken it to being an enlightened person. But as it relates to motivation, uh, the hierarchy of needs says that needs motivate us in this order. So you start at the bottom and you work your way up. So the first need is physiological needs. And these are needs to satisfy hunger, thirst, sex, fatigue. So we have these needs and then we will do whatever we need to do to satisfy them. So if we're hungry, we'll um, be motivated and go ahead and get some food to eat to satisfy that need of hunger. And then safety needs is the next level on the pyramid, and these are our needs to feel secure and safe and out of danger. Uh, so if we are in a neighborhood that we feel is sketchy, we might be motivated to lock the doors on the car um, by these safety needs. And then the next level of the pyramid is belongingness and love needs. And these are our needs to be valued and appreciated by others, uh, to be accepted and to feel that we belong um, and our need to be around other people. The next uh, level are our esteem needs, and these are our needs to achieve, be competent, gain approval, gain recognition, and uh, these needs might be the needs that got you to sign up for college. And then we have um, cognitive needs, which are our needs to know and understand and explore um, maybe to ask questions about our purpose, why we're here, what happens when we die, um, or to understand things from a scientific perspective, how things work. Any way that you are interested in gaining knowledge about any subject, um, this is explained by these cognitive needs. And then we have aesthetic needs, and these are our needs to appreciate beauty in the world, to find um, the order and symmetry that surrounds us in our environment and then, you know, also within ourselves. And then the highest need is the need for self-actualization. And this is the point that is seldom reached, but it's the point at which people have sufficiently satisfied their lower needs and have achieved their full human potential. One of the things that has been said to happen to people that are self-actualized are these peak experiences 
which are times in a person's life where they temporarily meet uh, self-actualization and they might um, feel like they are high on drugs, although they've not ingested drugs. They just feel this overwhelming sense of um, peace or happiness or pleasure. Um, and in extreme cases, there have been people who say that they're having uh, peak experiences that uh, create sort of out-of-body experiences for them. So uh, you can kind of grapple with that and think about, you know, what you believe or don't believe uh, as it relates to peak experiences. And then uh, recently a gentleman named Viktor Frankl proposed that maybe there's even a higher level on the uh, pyramid here, which is transcendence. And transcendence is uh, where you kind of leave a state of self-absorption and instead of thinking about, um, you know, what the world can give to you, you start thinking about what you can give to the world and you become completely unconcerned with your own self. Uh, you transcend your ego. You transcend any selfishness. Um, and you might even be motivated to help others achieve self-actualization. And the last theory of motivation is called the self-determination theory. And uh, this is a theory that talks about the idea of social context and how that affects um, an action. So if you are giving a presentation for at work, for example, and you think that if you do really well on this presentation, people at work are going to be impressed by you. Perhaps you even get a raise. Um, you feel achievement about this because of the feedback you get from people at your work. And so the more positive you expect the social outcomes to be, the more motivated you are to do well on that presentation, according to this theory. So this theory says that we have three needs that motivate our behavior in a social context. And um, these three needs help us to gain a complete sense of self and maintain healthy relationships with people. So we're kind of constantly striving to have these needs met. So the first need is autonomy, which is the need to be in control of our own behavior and our goals. The next one is competence, and this is the need to be able to master the challenging tasks of our lives, whether that be being a student, completing schoolwork, being a friend, a, a partner, whatever it may be. Relatedness is the need to feel a sense of belonging, intimacy, and security in relationships with others, so an ability to be your complete vulnerable self without the uh, fear of ridicule or uh, being taken advantage of. And so um, the self-determination theory says that in order to satisfy these needs, we need to have a supportive environment where we are encouraged uh, and, and helped to develop our goals and our relationships. Um, and competence is achieved through feedback and success, and autonomy is achieved through knowing that your actions were controlled by you, that, that you did it, and sort of taking ownness and accountability and feeling good about your accomplishments. So research has found that there is a negative impact on a person's intrinsic motivation when an extrinsic reward is given, and much of the self-determination theory focuses on the idea of uh, fostering an intrinsic motivation because, as you've seen, autonomy, competence, and relatedness would all be kind of facets of a person with a strong intrinsic motivation. These things are motivating them um, to achieve in certain areas or to accomplish certain tasks, and uh, these things are definitely a facet of intrinsic motivation. Okay, let's uh, check out this TED Talk on the psychology of self-motivation. Thank you. Thank you. Beyond boundaries. What a theme, huh? Beyond. Now, when I think of boundaries, I think of rules, regulations, and restrictions. And I think of the parents and the teachers and the supervisors who hold us accountable 
with regard to those boundaries. Now, that's not a bad thing. I know if you're like me, I need supervisors. I need someone holding me accountable to do the right thing. But beyond boundaries is something different. I think of those leaders, those teachers, those supervisors, those parents who inspire us to go beyond the call of duty, to, to do more than we have to, to do it not because they tell us, but because we want to. I would like to share with you what the research says about how to make that happen. And not just for other people, but for yourself. Here's the deal. How can we inspire people and ourselves to be self-motivated? There's another word. It's called empowerment. You've heard that word, right? Now, the management definition of empowerment is get her done. Just get her done with fewer resources and less time. I empower you. Make it happen. I'm talking about feeling empowered. That's different. Feeling empowered is when you're self-motivated. Now, if you want to know if you feel empowered or if your child, your student, your worker feels empowered, ask them three questions. And if they yes, say yes to these three questions, they will feel empowered. And by the way, this is not based on common sense, it's based on research. But you've all been there, so it'll feel like common sense. Question number one, can you do it? Albert Bandura calls it self-efficacy. Do you believe you can do it? Do you have the time, the knowledge, and the training to do what we're asking you to do? If you answer yes, good. Second question, will it work? Do you believe that we're asking you to do the process that will work? Albert Bandura calls that response efficacy, believing that the behavior will lead to the ultimate outcome. By the way, that takes education, right? We have to show them the data. We might show them some theory. We might we show them, teach them why this might work. I just use the word education. Earlier, I used the word training. Is there a difference? In elementary school, it, we call it education. Middle school, education. High school, education. College, higher education. <laughs> then you go to industry, what do you call it? Training. You have your training department. There must be a difference. Well, you know the difference. Do you want your kids to have sex education or sex training? <laughs> and your kids might answer the question differently. Because <laughs> you know that training means you do the behavior and you get feedback. That's powerful. Powerful. Have you ever heard this word, online training? It's an oxymoron, isn't it? I mean, training is watch the behavior. Get online training, it's like plastic silverware. Jumbo shrimp, legal brief, country music. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't work. Okay, so if you answer yes to it will work, third question, is it worth it? So we've had a training question. We've had an educational question. This is the motivational question. Do you believe the consequences? This is about consequences. B.F. Skinner taught us this, selection by consequences. Dale Carnegie quoted B.F. Skinner and said, from the day you were born, everything you did was because you wanted something for doing it. Consequences. Is it worth it? So you have to convince people that it's worth it. Now, by the way, if you answer yes to those three questions, you feel competent. Am I right? You feel competent at doing worthwhile work. You've all been there. When you feel competent at doing worthwhile work, you're more likely to be self-motivated. You've been there. No one has to be looking over you. You feel Now, here's the challenge, leaders, teachers. How do you inspire people to feel competent? Well, you give them feedback. You give them recognition. You show them they are competent. Okay, I got one more. The other C word, choice. Your common sense will tell you. When you believe you have a sense of autonomy, a sense of choice in what you're doing, you feel more self-motivated. B.F. Skinner taught us that too. 
In his book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, way back in 1971, reading that book changed my life because I realized that I am controlled by consequences. But sometimes I don't feel controlled. When I'm working for a pleasant consequence, it feels good. It feels like I'm working to get something. When I'm working to avoid an aversive consequence, I feel controlled. That's called negative reinforcement. So here's a challenge, leaders. How do we get people to become success seekers rather than failure avoiders? First day of introductory psychology class, I teach two classes of 600 students. Maybe some of you have been in that class. And remember, the first day I say, how many are here to avoid failure? And 80% raise their hand. And I say, well, thanks for coming. I, I know you're motivated, but you're not happy campers. You probably told your friends, I got to go to class. It's a requirement. Not I get to go to class, it's an opportunity. You probably woke up to an alarm clock, not an opportunity clock. <laughs> and it's all in how you see it. Really, it's all in how you see it. It's your paradigm. It's how you communicate to others and how you communicate to yourself. So Ellen Langer said in her book, Mindfulness, she said, and psychologists know, when you perceive choice, you perceive motivation. You're more motivated. So the deal is, for yourself, sit back and reflect. Be mindful of the choices you have. And talk about being a success seeker rather than a failure avoider. It's all how you talk, how you communicate to yourself and to others. I've got a fourth C word, community. Powerful word. Psychologists know that social support is critical. People who perceive a sense of relatedness, a sense of connection with other people, they feel motivated and they're happier. I want to recite a, recite a poem. It's called The Cookie Thief by Valerie Cox. And as I recite this poem, there's only two characters, a man and a lady. Put yourself in the situation. Be mindful. Think about the situation and what you would do. Okay, here we go. A woman was waiting in an airport one night with several hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in an airport shop, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book and happened to see that the man beside her, as bold as could be, took a cookie or two from the bag between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. She read, munched cookies, and watched the clock as a gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. When only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and he broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy has some nerve, and he's also rude. He didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known what she'd been so galled, and she sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed for the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane and sank on her seat. Then she sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. <laughs> if mine are here, she moaned in despair. Then the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. So where were you when I, when I was, where were you? Whose side were you on? Were you thinking independent or interdependent? I don't blame you if you think independent. You know, that's how we're raised. Nice guys finish last. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. Got to blow your own horn. You know, independent. We come in this, in this life of ours, dependent to others, and then we can't wait to become teenagers, you know? We're too old to do what kids do, too young to do what adults do, so then we'll do what nobody else would do to assert our independence. And some of us get stuck there. We're stuck. I'll do it myself. I don't need you. Not good. We need each other. We have to have each other's back. 
We need a sense of community. This independence culture that we got, we got to move to interdependent. Okay, four C words that can fuel self-motivation and I think can fuel actively caring for people. Let me tell you a story to put it all together. It happened over 60 years ago. I remember it like yesterday. My parents asked me, hey Scott, how'd you like to get drum lessons? How'd you like to play the drums? Oh man, would I ever? I'm thinking of Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa. Most of you guys don't know those names, but they were the drummers. In those days, a drum was in the front of the band. They had white pearl drum sets, and I saw myself. That was my vision. I had a vision. Consequences, that was my vision. And I said, yeah, I want to take drum lessons. So the teacher would bring his drum and sit next to mine. I didn't have a nice drum like this. My parents bought me a beat-up old drum at an auction. And they said to me, if you get better, if your teacher tells us you get, ah, oh, they're holding me accountable. Teacher says you're getting better. We'll get you a better snare drum and then a bass drum and then some cymbals. And that was my vision and that kept me going. Consequences. So the teacher would come in and he would show me stuff. You know, this is how the left hand, this is how Buddy Rich plays with his left hand and his right hand. And they would just do things like a flam. Can you hear that in the back? You okay? And this is, this is a rim shot. He would show me stuff. I was just 10 years old, remember? And when he showed me stuff, I felt, wow. He showed me this little simple drum beat. Watch me, Scott. Watch this. And I practiced it, and I did it. I'm feeling competent. He showed me a paradiddle. Listen, paradiddle, paradiddle. And he said, you go home when you practice next week. I want to see your paradiddle. And I said, watch this. And I said, watch this. He said, that's a double paradiddle. Hey, we're not, we didn't get there yet. I'm reading ahead. Because <laughs> I'm self-motivated. I feel competent. I'm walking through Muhlenberg High School, Allentown, Pennsylvania, and I see the music teacher, and he says, I heard you're learning to play the drums. I said, yeah, and I'm getting good. He said, you can march in the band. You can be the snare drummer. Whoa, that felt good. Another vision. Then the teacher comes into my... This was, these were private lessons, by the way, $2, $2. That was a long time ago. He said, he said Scott, you ready to do a drum roll? I said, of course, I, I'm ready for a drum roll. He says, watch, Scott, here you go, watch this. Um, would you do that again? <laughs> Scott, this is easy, watch me. Now you practice that, and next week, I want to see a drum roll. He comes back the next week, he says, how's your drum? Um, I can do a power diddle. That's regression. <laughs> I want to see a drum roll. Week after week, now we're talking about distress. Now we're talking about apathy. Now we're talking about learned helplessness. That's what psychologists call it. I remember walking through that elementary school and seeing a music teacher, and he said, uh, so Scott, how you doing, how are the drums? <sighs> Not so good. I can't do a drum roll. You know, like, like adults always say, never say can't. You can be anything you want to be, Scott. <laughs> no, I can't do a drum roll. I've tried and I tried and I, I've kind of given up. And he said, Scott, when you ever get overwhelmed, break it down. Break it down. Can you do a paradiddle? Yeah. Okay, what's the second beat? Two beats. Yeah, well, that's a drum roll, Geller. It's two beats. You go home and you practice and you say, Dad, Dad, Mama. Remember, I was just 10. You go, Dad, Dad, Mama, Dad, Dad, Mama, Dad, Dad, Mama, Dad, Dad. It's a drum roll. That teacher came back the next week. Okay, Scott, I guess you can't do a drum roll. I said, Watch this. He said, Whoa! How'd you learn to do that? And I showed my teacher. I taught my teacher, 10 years old. He said, I'd forgotten that it's, I got into the habit of just doing this. I forgot that it's too big. You taught me how to teach the drum roll, Scott. There's a lesson there. We can always learn from each other. We need to have the humility to accept feedback 
and the courage to speak up. And we need to help each other feel self-motivated. How? Given the perception of competence. Teach him about consequences drive us, you know? Let him perceive choice and let him know it's community. We're all in this together and we need each other. Thank you. All right, so what we're going to take a look at now are the two most popular or most researched primary drives, hunger and sex. So one question that researchers have been asking about the primary drive of hunger is what is the motivation behind the primary drive of hunger? Why are some of us motivated to starve ourselves? Why are some of us motivated to eat even though we're not hungry? Um, and so we're going to kind of look at um, the uh, research and answers to these questions. It is important to kind of note that the perception of ideal body or, or the ideal body image really does depend on your culture and the time in which you live. So for example, in the uh, 50s and 60s, um, what would be considered a plus size model today was a highly sought after body type. Um, Marilyn Monroe was considered the sex symbol in our country and she would equate to a size eight plus size model um, today. And so as you can see here on the slide, there were advertisements uh, for products that women could take to help them to gain weight. Um, whereas now, of course, uh, there's a, a much different ideal body image. Um, and then, you know, in the 60s and 70s, there was Twiggy, who's a, a woman you see on the slide here, at least according to my mom, was a, a beautiful woman with the body type that a lot of other women sought to model their bodies after. Um, and then when we got into the uh, 90s, we saw kind of this boom in breast augmentations and women with larger breasts were uh, sort of considered to have the ideal body. So you had your Tyra Banks and your Baywatch um, girls, Pamela Anderson, Carmen Electra. And then now in the 2000s, it seems to be all about the Kardashians and the big booties. Um, so the idea is that, you know, what is considered a perfect body really changes just within time, even in our culture. And then, of course, in other cultures, uh, what we today might consider overweight is a highly uh, sexualized woman. Because in impoverished nations where food is a scarce resource, a larger woman can represent someone with wealth or the ability to get food. Okay, but with that being said, let's talk about obesity. Obesity is defined as body weight that is more than 20% above the average weight for a person of a particular height. And the reason that we are talking about obesity here is because it's becoming an epidemic in our country. Uh, Two-thirds of the USA is overweight, and this is uh, causing recent increases in heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and ultimately premature death. So um, the issue of obesity might help us to understand why some of us eat in the absence of hunger, um, but there might be other explanations for obesity besides just overeating that we want to take a look at. So let's take a look at this video that discusses some of those issues. Resolutions to lose some extra pounds are common this time of year, and they couldn't come soon enough. As we begin this new decade, the country is facing a dangerous weight problem. Consider this. In the late 1970s, 15 percent of American adults were obese. By the early 90s, that number had jumped to 23 percent, and most recently, 35 percent. So how do we reduce our waistlines and return to a healthier state? Seth Doan traveled the nation to weigh what's being done about this growing crisis as CBS reports where America stands. Okay, three peas are 50 and a guy 50. The evidence of an epidemic is everywhere. Two thirds, 190 million Americans are overweight or obese. If you had to grade the United States when it comes to obesity. Well, I'd give us an F. 
a national report card no one is proud of. Obesity-related diseases are a nearly $150 billion medical burden every year. We're going to end up as a nation of uh, cardiac cripples. Childhood obesity has tripled in the last 30 years. This could be the first generation since the Civil War to have a shorter life expectancy. It's not hurting, is it? To gauge the problem, a team of doctors and cardiologists from Houston's Memorial Hermann Hospital set up a mass unit of sorts in a middle school gym. We're almost done. Just a few yeah, more pictures no. of your heart, OK? Running a battery of tests on 97 seemingly healthy children. I think it is a communication between yeah. the aorta and the pulmonary. But the results? Houston, we have a problem. Reveal an alarming reality here. The three out of every four children are either overweight or obese. That means about 70 of these children are on a high-risk trajectory for coronary artery disease by their 30s and 40s. Dr. Joshua Samuels treats kids with the blood pressure levels of an unhealthy adult. Back at his clinic, 11-year-old Wesley Randall has dangerously high blood pressure and is 60 pounds overweight. I just eat to solve my problems for some reason. A few years down the road, these are the people who are going to be flooding into our hospitals and emergency rooms. 15-year-old Emily Allen is trying to avoid just that. Just what I used to look like and then what I look like now kind of upsets me. The Hudson, Michigan teen was healthy at age 5, but by 10 she'd become obese and could no longer fit into kids' clothing. Why did I look like that? It seems to me that there's some degree of pain or hurt in, in guilt. looking at that. Guilt? Mm -hmm. Why guilt? I just feel guilty that I couldn't change it early. On doctor's orders, Emily joined a weight loss program called Empower at the University of Michigan. That's better. Where she's already lost 26 pounds, thanks in part to support from other teens like 16-year-old Amber Bell, who's in an even scarier life and death struggle. She's shed 50 pounds, but still weighs nearly 400. What made you say, I am going to make a change here? I didn't want my parents to feel like I was a failure and I wanted to have fun. For Amber, Emily, and so many families, the battle started with money. So we kind of had to start buying cheaper foods. And, and that's when you started gaining weight? Yeah. Is it a luxury to be able to eat healthy food? It's becoming more of a luxury. Kelly Brownell studies obesity at Yale University and says the government does not help by subsidizing corn, an ingredient in virtually every sweetener. Corn farmers were paid $56 billion over the last 10 years by the federal government to grow their crop. Produce farmers, not a dime. If you go to McDonald's today, you can buy a quarter pounder with cheese meal. That means the large drink and the large french fries for less than it costs to buy a salad and a bottle of water. There's something wrong with that picture. We all remember that idyllic Norman Rockwell picture of 1950s America, but that has certainly changed. Today, we consume more than 500 extra calories a day than a quarter century ago. It's easy to see why in a place like Baldwin Park, California, population 81,000. With six fast food restaurants or convenience stores for every one place that offers fresh produce, this community might seem at the root of the problem. But in fact, it's on the forefront of a grassroots solution. Here, they're trying to innovate. <laughs> Connie Gonzalez and her mother, Maria, Here, Connie. volunteer with the program Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities. The group pushed for a ban on new drive through windows. Since 2006, not a single fast food restaurant has opened. Here. Fresh produce is now stocked in stores that never carried it. Maybe the big one? And Maria flags the healthy food for shoppers. Connie helped convince the school board to make salad bars a staple. <laughs> and 100 minutes of weekly phys ed is now mandatory. With all this, in five years, 135 kids here are no longer overweight. Why does it take a whole community? Because one individual can't really change much, but if a city comes together, we can change a whole lot. But that's not enough, says Kelly Brownell. He likens the war on obesity to the one against tobacco. The parallels are stunning. Marketing to children, distorting the science, 
uh, influencing policymakers and the like. The consumer is bombarded by the food industry, which spent $30 billion on advertising last year. And even the world's largest nutrition group, the American Dietetic Association, has a list of sponsors that includes the very companies selling unhealthy products. The single best thing that ever happened to fight tobacco were high taxes on cigarettes. Those taxes increased the cost for a pack of cigarettes and led to a drastic drop in smoking. Brownell studies show that a penny per ounce tax on sugared beverages like soda would cut consumption and raise billions that could fight obesity. Isn't it our own responsibility to, to moderate our behavior? The personal responsibility approach is a fine place to start, but we've been doing that for 40 years now and we're losing the battle with obesity. That's been an experiment that has failed. But additional taxes and more regulation are certainly a tough sell. A CBS News poll released just minutes ago shows that 60 percent of people oppose a tax on junk food. So while we may agree that something must be done in this battle against obesity, Katie, we do not agree on what. Meanwhile, junk food and no P.E. seems like a recipe for disaster for so many kids Indeed. in this country. It's, it's scary. heartbreaking. It is. And good luck to all those kids who are trying to get healthier. Seth Dome, thanks so much for Thank that you. great report. So there are a lot of different environmental factors that explain why we eat, even in the absence of hunger. And so some of those factors include social factors. Maybe someone offers us a dessert or something they cook for us and we feel a societal pressure to eat. Um, when we go to events where there is socializing, it's often centered around food at a party or out to dinner. And also, psychologists argue that we get on an eating schedule very early on. There's breakfast before you go to school and then lunch is served at school and dinners when you get home around five or six. Um, and so this makes us think we are hungry in that Pavlovian classical conditioning type of way at these certain times, even though we may not be hungry or need to eat at those particular times. There are emotional factors that influence uh, when we eat and why we eat. For example, we may have associated food with comfort at a very early age, and so now we eat when we are upset um, and this can be a learned behavior so parents may have given us food as a reward uh, you get an A on a project at school and your parents take you out to ice cream or it could have been offered to us as some type of soothing mechanism so right away when you're born into the world one of the very first things you do is eat and then whenever a child cries one of the first things that a parent tries to do to soothe the child is is feed them so we associate food with comfort very early on we find it rewarding um, and so these emotional factors might drive us to eat even if we're not hungry and then also food acts as a temporary distraction from our problems it requires um, us to use all of our senses we smell food we see it we taste it we touch it um, we hear the crunch of it or the cooking of it, and so it, it is a great distraction because it takes a lot of um, kind of processing on our brain's part through uh, all the sensory input that we get with food. Cultural factors in hunger can determine what types of food we eat and um, how much we eat. So there are cultures that consume rat and dog, and it does have nutritional value to eat those things, but we consider them unappetizing because they don't fit within our culture. And then also, our culture influences our portion size. In our country, in the USA, we have very big portions relative to other cultures. In reality, the amount of food that we need per meal is, is about the size of your palm, depending on the meal. You can see it represented here on the slide. But our portion sizes are, are much bigger than just the size of our palm for a meal. So the biological factors that influence the hunger drive um, include some of these internal mechanisms that we have that tell us when to eat and to stop eating, which are like sugar in our blood gets low when we're hungry, sensory receptors in our stomach create those hunger pangs when we need to eat, and when we are full. Um, and then we have the hypothalamus, which is the brain part that's responsible for monitoring food intake. 
However, even with all these internal mechanisms that are supposed to kind of control how much we eat, we still have a weight set point. And a weight set point is a particular level of weight that an individual's body strives to maintain. So what this means is that everyone's weight set point is different. Um, and then as you go through life, there are environmental factors that can alter your weight set point. So if you have damage to the hypothalamus through drug use or brain injury, this can alter the weight set point, which can cause a person to become obese or malnutritioned. And then we also have um, our metabolic rate or our metabolism, and this is the rate at which food is converted to energy and expended by the body. So uh, how quick your me metabolic rate is or your metabolism is, is in part genetic, um, and this does help to determine if you're going to have a higher or lower weight set point. Some psychologists say that obesity is due to over sensitivity to external eating cues um, and an insensitivity to internal hunger cues. So it's like the idea that if you're watching the Food Network and you've just eaten dinner, uh, but the food on the Food Network looks very appetizing, you might eat and ignore the fact that your stomach is very full, but you're compelled to eat because you're really motivated by how good that food looks on TV. Um, and so another explanation for obesity could be higher weight set point. Some people are just born with a higher body weight um, that their body strives to maintain. And then also the size and number of fat cells that you have is inherited. And um, what we know is that the number of fat size that you're born or fat cells that you're born with is the number of fat cells that you will have your whole life unless of course you get liposuction, but even through diet and exercise, you don't get rid of fat cells. All you do is alter the size of them. So you can shrink your fat cells, but you can't rid yourself of them. And some people are born with more fat cells than other people. So another kind of research question that we talked about that's studied in psychology is, uh, why do people starve themselves even when they are hungry? So, um, this could, of course, constitute an eating disorder, and two of the uh, most well-known and common eating disorders are anorexia nervosa and bulimia. So anorexia nervosa is a severe eating disorder in which people may refuse to eat while denying that their behavior and appearance are unusual. And it's a condition in which a person reduces eating to the point that a weight loss of 15% below the ideal body weight uh, based on your height and age, or even more than that, uh, even a higher percentage of, than that can occur. 10% of people with anorexia uh, actually end up starving themselves to death. And what's interesting is that generally we find a correlation between anorexia and people that typically come from stable homes that are attractive and successful. Some people argue that um, anorexia is um, really in part largely about gaining control in your life and feeling as though you can control uh, what goes into your body and how much you weigh and, and maybe that gives you a satisfaction or a sense of control that you feel you otherwise don't have. So it's argued that it's not always about the food or the weight loss or even the way you look necessarily, but underneath all of that there's a more kind of inconspicuous cause for the anorexia which might be a control issue. Um, and so we find that people with anorexia actually often cook for others, they shop for food frequently, they collect cookbooks. Um, they're kind of standing in the face of temptation and demonstrating their extreme control over not giving in to that temptation. And also um, in, in the same way that they're trying to not consume food, um, which would take an immense amount of energy because we it is a, a, a primary drive uh, to eat. And so um, it would take a lot of kind of cognitive effort to do that. And so your brain would end up spending a lot of time thinking about food, um, not necessarily thinking about eating it, but just thinking about the topic of food um, as you are trying to avoid consuming it. So this might lead you to become kind of obsessed with food collecting the cookbook, shopping for food frequently, doing all of those things. 
Bulimia is a condition in which a person develops a cycle of binging or overeating enormous amounts of food at one sitting and then using unhealthy methods to avoid weight gain, like purging uh, through either laxatives or through vomiting. Um, and this can lead to heart failure. Often when a person uses vomiting as their method of purging after binging, um, the stomach acid will cause their teeth to kind of decay as it eats away at the enamel on the tooth. And so uh, one kind of sign of a person who might be suffering from bulimia is if you start to notice uh, that their teeth are kind of rotting or looking decayed. So when psychologists look to research what causes a person to have an eating disorder, um, one of the kind of main theories behind it has to do with just the societal influence of um, the media. Particularly in our country, there seems to be a value on uh, skinny people and people that are uh, might, what might be considered underweight. Um, and then biologically, there tends to be a chemical imbalance in the hypothalamus in people that have eating disorders and brain scans show that people with disorders process information about food different than healthy people process information about food. So now we're going to look at the second most researched uh, primary drive in motivation, which is sexual motivation. And so what we know about sexual motivation is that the uh, thing that motivates sex the most is fantasies. 60% of people have fantasies not only during their daily activities, but also during sex, and often are about someone other than their partner. So common fantasies for both genders include being sexually irresistible and oral sex. Um, sexual motivation can come from anything that we made a prior sexual association with. Uh, the smell of perfume, a song, any of these things can be arousing to a person. And there are cases of sexual deviant behavior or um, a paraphilia, which is when a person is aroused by something that a society might consider abnormal. And a paraphilia can become a very powerful obsession and or compulsion. Um, in fact, there is a case study of a man named Wayne Dumond who would, um, who had been convicted for the rape and murder of several different women and he was so ashamed of himself and his um, urge and compulsion to rape women that he actually castrated himself um, and after this he, he kind of had assumed that castrating himself would prevent him from raping any other women and he thought this might take away the urge however it didn't um, because of course the urge or the paraphilia exists in the mind and not in the genitals and so he continued to sexually assault women even after castrating himself. So research shows that men think about sex more than women. 54% uh, of men report that they think about sex at least once per day and uh, part of the explanation for why men might think about sex more than women is that men have what are called androgens. And these are male sex hormones secreted by the testes. They include testosterone. Uh, men begin secreting these at puberty and they increase the male sex drive. Um, these androgens are actually produced constantly, so male sexual behavior can occur almost any time. Whereas with women, um, they have estrogen, which is the class of female sex hormones, uh, including progesterone. And this is a female sex hormone secreted by the ovaries, but progesterone isn't secreted constantly like uh, testosterone is. Instead, it follows a cyclical pattern. Its greatest output actually occurs at ovulation when the woman is fertile. Um, so... This would explain why a woman might not think about sex as much as men because they're not constantly secreting sex hormones, whereas males are. So when psychologists research the relationship between sexual orientation and psychological adjustment in homosexuals and bisexuals, uh, we find the same quality of mental health. In other words, 
Um, homosexuality is not an indicator of any type of mental illness, of course. So about 5 to 10% of people report being a homosexual. And Alfred Kinsey produced a scale that suggests that people's sexual orientation depends on a person's uh, sexual, romantic feelings, and behaviors, um, and that it's not really a issue of this way or that way, but instead sexuality falls on a continuum, like you see here on the slide, where uh, people aren't just either 100% gay or 100% straight, but rather fall somewhere on this continuum. So when uh, psychologists and scientists research homosexuality, what we find is that uh, there is a lot of evidence for um, a person's sexual orientation being dispositional rather than situational, meaning that um, your sexual orientation seems to be something that you're born with, whether you're straight or gay or bisexual or where you fall on the Alfred Kinsey scale. So when psychologists do what we call twin studies, uh, which are to look at twins um, that are raised in different environments, or in some cases raised in the same environment, what we find in relation to sexual orientation is that when the twins are monozygotic, meaning that they're identical twins, so one egg is fertilized and then it splits into two eggs in the womb, um, but essentially those uh, two eggs or those two babies have the exact same DNA and when that is the case we tend to find that if uh, one twin is uh, homosexual the other one is as well and that's less common in dizygotic twins or fraternal twins when they have different DNA. So this could lend itself to supporting a genetic argument towards sexual orientation meaning that we're genetically predispositioned to um, our sexual orientation. So women used to be given a, a drug called DES that was supposed to prevent, uh, so pregnant women were given this drug, and it was supposed to prevent the likelihood of miscarriage. However, it, it, it really was not um, an effective drug, and in some cases it increased the likelihood of miscarriage. But as it relates to sexual orientation, studies found that women who took this drug uh, while their babies were still in the womb, were more likely to have homosexual and bisexual offspring, which may indicate that there is some hormonal component to our sexual orientation that um, is kind of creating our sexual orientation while we're still in the womb. And studies looking at the brain of uh, humans have found that the activity in the amygdala that governs sexual behavior is different in homosexuals than it is in heterosexuals. And actually, a heterosexual man and homosexual woman tend to have brain activity in the amygdala that is similar, whereas heterosexual women and homosexual men tend to have more similar brain activity in the amygdala. Studies have also shown that the anterior hypothalamus in gay males is larger than in straight males, so the structure of the brain is different um, at least within males, as it relate, relates to sexual orientation. Okay, so let's look uh, more at the science of uh, sexual orientation. When people talk about homosexuality, they often ask, is it a choice? I heard it is. Hello, what's your name? Christian. Well, Christian, let's see what the latest science has to say. Oh, that. To help us, here are two gay people, George and Martha. Before we can answer, is it a choice, we must first determine what it means to be gay. How do you know you're a homosexual? The same way you know that you're straight. Since the 19th century, many theories about homosexuality have been offered that are untestable and contradictory. Male homosexuality is the result of an absent father and an overbearing mother. See ya. Stand up straight, dear. And the female homosexual has never recovered from her anger over not having the penis. She wishes to avenge her perceived castration by taking another female as her sexual object. You're kidding me, right? Well, I've always been told that homosexuality is unnatural. Is it? In fact, homosexual relations are common in nature, including 
Zebras, baboons, dolphins, sheep, buffalo, ducks, foxes, elephants, horses, gorillas, moose, house cats, pigs, mice, rabbits, swans, and lions, to name a few. Well, okay, but we're not animals. Human beings have free will. You don't just decide who to love. <laughs> Settle down there, Martha. Christian does have a point. But let's take a look at the most recent scientific evidence. As they study sexual orientation, scientists are currently looking at three main areas, genes, hormones, and birth order. Of course, most of these studies focus only on male sexuality. Sorry, Martha. What a shock. Let's first look at studies of identical twins. Hi. When one identical twin is a gay man, the other twin is gay up to 70% of the time, far higher than would occur if genes played no role. In fact, these studies show that genes play a greater role in determining sexual orientation than they do in whether or not you're right or left-handed. And we don't punish the left-handed. Well, not anymore. Let's get it! Scientists have recently noticed a striking statistical phenomenon. Studies show that having older brothers increases the odds of a boy being homosexual. Moms always baby the youngest, making them gay. No, that's not it. When a woman is pregnant with a boy, scientists are realizing that her female body often sees the male fetus as a foreign object and begins to produce antibodies against it. The more boys a woman has, the more adept her body becomes at feminizing the fetus, which may explain why with every successive boy, the odds that he will be gay go up significantly. All right, maybe you all accept it, but what about those people who started out gay and say they became straight by discovering God? What about ex-gay ministries? Even so-called ex-gay ministries don't claim to change a person's inner sexual desires, just his or her sexual conduct. We're still gay. If these places really work, why don't they all use the same technique? Why does each ministry experiment its own way? Well... And why have so many members and leaders recanted earlier claims that they were changed? <laughs> Maybe these programs don't work for everyone, but what's the harm? How about the feelings of shame and guilt they instill and reinforce in their victims? Or the money, energy, and time they sap from people who have nothing wrong with them? Says you. <laughs> well, in point of fact, not just George says that, Christian. The American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Psychoanalytic Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the National Association of Social Workers have all stated that homosexuality should not be treated as a mental disorder, and that they oppose attempts at reparative or conversion therapy, and that sexual orientation is not a choice and cannot be changed. So that's it. I'm supposed to believe that it's not a choice just because all those doctors and scientists say so? Or he could just ask us. I do know this one girl named Heather who goes back and forth, but she's Shut a... up. <laughs> the information in this educational cartoon is based upon studies that can be found in any university library, with the possible exception of the Bob Jones University in South Carolina. <laughs> Okay, go ahead and pause the video, head on over to Moodle, complete the next lecture activity, and when you finished, come back to this point in the video. Okay, so now we're going to move on to a discussion on emotions, so let's uh, dive on in. So besides keeping life interesting, do emotions serve any other purpose? Do they have an adaptive purpose, or a Darwinistic purpose, or a social purpose, why do we have them? Well, what we know about emotions is that they prepare us for action. They act as a link between our environment and our responses. For example, if you see a, beer, a, a bear coming at you, you feel fear, and that fear um, inspires you or moves you into the action of running. Uh, another thing we know about the function of emotions is that they shape our future behavior. We learn from previous emotional experiences. So if you dated someone who was clingy and felt annoyed, you're going to avoid clingy people in the future. They can help us to interact more effectively with others. Our tone, facial cues can help people to understand us better. Um, so for example, 
one of the issues that people often have in communicating in text is that you can't see someone's facial expressions or hear their tone of voice, and so people can get confused with our messages and texting. So there's also kind of a controversy over whether or not we should or can categorize and label all of the possible human emotions that exist. Um, in the English language, there are at least 500 words used to describe emotions. Um, some psychologists say that no set of emotions should be singled out as the most basic, but the psychologists who feel like we should sort through our emotions and kind of find the fundamental basic emotions argue that they are happiness, anger, fear, sadness, disgust, and surprise. All right, with that, go ahead and pause the video. Uh, go over to Moodle, complete the last lecture activity, and then when you're done, come back to this point in the lecture. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the theories of emotion. So to do this, I want you to start by imagining that you are shopping and you think you see someone you don't uh, like, but you know them, and your heart starts beating fast and your palms get all sweaty and your breathing increases and you um, start to feel all these physical changes. So do these bodily changes cause you to have an emotion or are you having a bodily change because you've had an emotion? So James Lang actually believes that the emotional experience is a reaction to bodily events occurring as a result of an external situation. In other words, he thinks that our body has a physical change and then we interpret that physical change as an emotion. So he says that we feel sorry because we cry, uh, angry because we have struck somebody, afraid because we are trembling. So um, he says that we all have visceral experiences, which are for every major emotion, there is an accompanying physiological reaction of internal organs. And this pattern of visceral responses leads us to label the experience. The brain interprets these sensations as specific kinds of emotional experiences. So we start crying and we feel sad, according to James Lang. So some of the people that disagree with this theory argue that the timing is off. Uh, sometimes we feel sad and then we cry. Physiological changes might not always be leading to our emotion. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio between having a feeling and then having the emotional experience. We can cry from cutting an onion, but that doesn't necessarily mean we are sad. And some visceral responses belong to multiple emotions. So we can cry from being happy, we can cry from being sad, um, and so there are people who don't necessarily agree with James Lang, and then there are people that of course do. So the canon bard theory um, is kind of a response to the James Long, uh, Lang theory in that it argues that physiological arousal alone does not lead to the perception of emotion. But instead, this theory holds the belief that both physiological arousal and emotional experience are produced simultaneously within the person by the same nerve stimulus. So to break that down further, this theory believes that the thalamus is responding to some emotion producing stimulus and then the thalamus sends a signal to the autonomic nervous system which creates a visceral response and tells the cerebral cortex information about the emotional experience simultaneously. Um, so while this theory makes some good points, the main problem with it is that there's actually no research supporting the idea that the physical and emotional response are happening simultaneously. And finally, the last theory, the Schachter Singer theory, uh, suggests that we identify the emotion that we are experiencing based on observing our environment and then comparing ourselves with others around us. So this theory holds the belief that emotions are determined jointly by a non-specific kind of physiological arousal and its interpretation, and the way we interpret that physiological arousal is based on environmental cues. So pretend that you uh, see a man walking down a dark alley and another man following close behind. How do you feel? You might feel nervous at first, but then you see the first man laughing and kind of high-fiving the other guy when he sees him. 
So you are able to change your emotion from nervousness to peace or a sense of comfort once you uh, interpreted the environmental cues of the men laughing among seeing each other. So there actually is some research that supports this theory. Um, and in one study, what they did was uh, participants were told they would receive an injection of a vitamin, but really they were given epinephrine, which is a drug that increases heart and breathing rates. And then each participant was put in a situation with a confederate, which is a person that is kind of working with the researcher like an actor, but the participant doesn't know this. So each participant was put in a situation with a confederate, and the confederate either acted happy or angry. And the participants then asked to describe their emotion uh, and their own emotion. And each time their own emotion matched the emotion of the confederate. So um, they were having this physiological reaction because of the epinephrine, but whether that was going to be a happy uh, increase in their arousal or a unhappy, angry increase in their arousal was determined by how the confederate was acting. All right, that is it for this lecture. Um, so be, uh, be sure to make your first forum post and complete the uh, rest of the work for the week, and we will see you next week.